Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Match Show. I think it's episode number 27. I have no idea. But today, we are very excited to welcome onto the show Carlos, Carlos Cardona, who is running for the House of Representatives in the state of New Hampshire. He has been endorsed by Andrew Yang and Humanity Forward. And last week, he just won his Democratic primary. First of all, Carlos, uh, thank you for coming on the show, and congratulations on winning in the primary last week. Uh, how do you feel like coming off of that win? Like, I, I know it's got to be exciting, but you also got to have that feeling like, you know, we still have so much more work to do uh, to win the general election, start bringing so many of the policies that you're championing and the change you're trying to bring to the forefront. Well, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you to your audience. Um, I, I feel I feel good. Um, primary was it was a tough uh, season for us. Uh, this summer was very challenging, of course, with COVID nineteen and everything else that is challenging our times. Um, that said, I, I feel pretty good coming off from primary season. Um, it is the first time that I've had to deal with a primary, but we're we're excited about it that we came out. We had a civil conversation about why I'm better to represent. Um, Democrats on the ground. And, and now I'm focusing on showing why I'm better uh, representative than any of the other candidates running. Um, mm -hmm. The beauty about this race is that uh, there are no incumbents running. Uh, this is a race for uh, to show who's best, better off representing our city. And um, I've been representing our city in different forms for the past 14 years since the first day I got into politics at the age of 17. And I was at AmeriCorps for three years. So we feel we feel good. We feel good about the policies we're talking about. That said, um, I'm not going to take any vote for granted. And we're going to talk to every single human being to make sure that they they, they feel that they are they are heard. Um, and I'm going to be taking notes. I always carry my notebook with me and like making notes about every conversation that I have. Um, because I am young and I don't have all the answers to everything. Um, so I, I want to learn from people, but I know that I have the energy and I do have some life experience that is necessary. In mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, getting into politics at the age of 17, and you actually have quite a, a very inspiring life story. Um, like, could you talk a little bit about uh, your background and like how you got into politics um, at 17 years old? Yes. Um, so at the age, it really started at the age of 11 when, so my whole entire life I had been watching my grandfather running for office, many times losing um, and just fighting oppression. We grew up very poor in a shanty village in Puerto Rico. At the age of 11, between 11 and 12, my parents divorced and my mom was forced to moved to mainland, find two jobs to sustain us. And um, so I watched her struggle. Then she was diagnosed with cancer shortly after that, and she's been struggling fighting cancer her whole entire, my whole, pretty much my whole existence. And at the age of 15, I came out as LGBTQ. And when I came out, um, I saw my mom struggling to feed her three boys, me and my two brothers. Um, her having to work two jobs and life was really getting to me and I just couldn't handle the pressure and I just decided to run away from home. Um, at the age of 16 is when I ran away and um, I was homeless for about a year. Uh, it was like nine months um, and it was really tough. I, I very quickly realized how tough life is and how much tougher it was without my mom and, and the sacrifices that she had to make. Um, but I kept fighting. Um, then a couple of years later, uh, well, a couple of months later, after finding a job and starting to get stable, uh, I found my partner and we started dating and we moved in together. Life became easier when there are two working adults um, that were working two jobs. Um, but I, I was quickly realizing how incredibly tough it is to get out of homelessness, um, regardless of whatever any other issues you may have in your life. And so I couldn't graduate high school. I found myself fighting the superintendent of schools for my right to be able to graduate. Um, I had to pay for my own education in order to get my high school diploma, which I believe is unconstitutional. It's wrong that somebody under the age of 18 has to pay for their high school diploma. So I decided to use that experience and run for school board. Um, 
So I ran for school board very quickly, became the youngest elected official in, 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 the, in the state. And I'm sure at the time in the country, um, became the first Hispanic elected to office. Um, and I led a whole entire school district and fi uh, finance committee, um, having one of the most progressive budgets and making sure that we protected teachers while at the same time provide students the funds, you know, the school district, the funds they needed to so that students can get the education that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And um, we also, you know, closed the loopholes on some of the things that were stopping homeless teens from graduating for, for, uh, from high school. Um, so so those, those were my experiences that I had, and I used that experience to fix those problems. So that's how I became the youngest elected official. Um, then right after that, I joined AmeriCorps, served for three years. And basically, um, I just kept serving the community because I felt, you know, it was in me, like, I, I felt that I had that energy and that passion to listen to people and translate that into community action um, and policies that can better off, um, make our communities better off. Yeah. So that's how it started. And here we are. Yeah, that's um really, uh, I mean, you have such a, a incredible story uh, that has so many ups and downs. And I think it mirrors like uh, what a lot of people face in their own life experiences, just the trials and tribulations of life. And I think, honestly, we need more people who have that lived experience in government. And that is something that I think uh, hopefully voters will be able to see in you and see someone that really cares. And kind of going along like uh, those lines in your political journey, there's actually a bunch of articles about you in the Washington Post and NPR about how uh, early in the primary, you were able to host every single presidential candidate at your house. And from what I understand, it was more of like uh, to allow the community to get to know the candidates there in Laconia. How did that like come all together in like that's something like meeting all the candidates as uh, someone who's running on the local level, level yourself. What was like uh, just uh, like your mindset as you met these people that are like at the top, like a lot of them are at the top, like making a lot of these decisions and like you're all the way at the bottom. So it's just such a the dichotomy or whatever between those two. It's very interesting. Um, yes. So basically, um, it was intentional. My goal was to put my city in the map. Um, this city, for many reasons, has been forgotten. And it's the reason why Donald Trump won it by 14%, which is unbelievable for a city that has so many struggles. And Donald Trump has not addressed one single one. Um, so to me, I wanted to make a point that when we put a community on the map, when we highlight it, when we lift it up, we can solve some of the problems. And of course, the federal government will take attention. And in this case, um, it was by hosting all presidential candidates and actually started off with Andrew Yang. Um, he was having an event in Manchester, New Hampshire, which is a very common place to have events. And I said, I'm going to drive there, meet him. I'm going to tell him my story and hopefully he'll hear me out and come to my community to hear the rest of the stories of people that I know, my community, and maybe he'll do something about it. And so, and I, I'm fortunate enough that I have a beautiful home, large enough that for these candidates is attractive to come down to. And of course, host a large crowd in the winter, which we don't have many locations in this area where you can host a large crowd in the winter. So, and let's face it, nobody wants to have an event outside in the freezing cold weather. So, um, so I used those that, uh, advantages that I have. And of course, my position as chairman of the Laconia Democrats, which I had ran for literally a month before approaching Andrew Yang um, and won um, unanimously. So I, I ran specifically because I wanted to highlight my city and I wanted to make sure that we put local Democrats on the map. So. I didn't have intentions that I was going to run for office in the future. I felt like I was done running for office. What I wanted to do is just lift the community as much as possible so that whoever runs next has a better uh, connection to the community so that they feel like, okay, we know what the problems are. We have, we're connected with people on the ground. And that's really what I wanted to accomplish. So when I went to, I spoke. Oops, we lost uh, Carlos there. I'm not sure if you can still hear me, Carlos, but uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Can Your you screen's black, me? though. Let's but see. 
Oops. We lost Carlos. Um, we'll uh, wait uh, for Carlos to come back. If uh, Oh, he's already back. Yeah, broadband is terrible here, so I apologize. Yeah. Um, well, that's one of the things we need is universal broadband. Like, you don't, you don't actually... I didn't realize how bad it was till I actually left my uh, my population center and started going into the rural areas of the country. And it's like you think of how important just Internet is to the economy. And you have no idea how many presidential candidates came here and they were setting up to do live feeds. And they were like, oh, my God, this is like a dead zone. <laughs> and I'm like, now you understand why I'm driving these like you guys need to see this community, not just mine, like most of rural America. And, and now during COVID-19, it's even life or death to some people. To kids yeah. is whether they get a public education or not. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of these people that are in Washington, D.C. Are, are, are oblivious as to what's happening in the rest of the country because they don't visit it. So that's really what I want to accomplish. So I talked to Andrew Yang, told him my story, and he was so moved. He's like, I, I don't know how many times he thanked me for telling my story at that event. And... Oops. Sorry, sorry happened again. Um, no, no need worries. To thank me. No, no need to thank me. Um, just come to my community and like listen to people. He listened to us. Um, he actually hosted the most events in this community. He came here back like 12 times, no joke. And I, would, I felt so privileged every single time that he would take my invitation and come here. He actually even hosted a giant event to benefit the community and local Democrats, which I think speaks volume for a candidate. Um, and then after him, so I got to know him before he was like, famous as you guys all know him now. Mm -hmm. And so like, I was so happy that I got to him when I did, um, we develop a friendship and clearly he's shown his gratitude for what I did for him now by supporting me and my candidacy. And not only gratitude, I think he realizes like how much I'm doing here. And a lot of the times alone, um, just because in this community, everybody's working really hard day and night, two jobs. Like, so it's hard for them to get involved in politics. Um, and of course, state, being a state representative, I don't think the country realizes that the state of New Hampshire doesn't even pay minimum wage to their state representatives. Uh, it pays $200 for two year service. So basically $100 a year. Um, so the sacrifice that you have to make in order to bring these policies forward is tremendous. So, you know, that's where our community has fallen in the gaps. Um, unfortunately, not many of us have been able to run because we're so busy running our lives and we can't make a living out of $200 every two years. So so he heard that and he was like baffled by it. He, of course, did his research because he couldn't believe it. And then he got back to me, called me myself when he's like, man, I'm so sorry what you have to go through in order to even have a conversation about what's happening in your community. And he's like, count me in. And so, of course, after him, we invited Tulsi Gabbard, and then all the candidates started rolling in. Uh, it was one after another. And I was like, there was days that I would spend a whole entire week, seven hours on the phone, just organizing these events. Um, I don't think people realize how much it takes to host candidates, especially after they become famous. So the more famous Andrew Yang was coming, the more complicated these events would be. Um, so like, and it was not his fault. It was just security was needed. Like the venues needed to be like perfect setting for people to be like, um, so basically accessible to them for dis disabilities and all of that. Like it was just growing and growing. And so the events were getting crazier and crazier. I think the largest event I had was like almost 2000 people. And to most of you guys listening, if you live in a big city, you're like 2000 people is nothing. We fit that in, in a corner here in our city. Well, to my city, a population 16,000, 2000 people in one spot is a lot. It's a lot on traffic, our little roads, it's a rural <laughs> community. So like, I remember hosting Pete Buttigieg and we had about 600 RSVP and then like, over a thousand seven hundred people showed up and i'm like oh my god where are we gonna fit all these cars like where are we gonna fit all these people and we literally ended up having three events in one site one inside one outside and then there's another location down the street that we ended up hosting another one um and there was at one point with andrea and we hosted at a coffee shop 
and it got too big. Then at a community college, it was too big. And, you know, so that's the kind of like, you know, struggles we had to go through, but I'm happy um, because we were able to do something great for my community. Instead of my community being known for, you know, whatever the news publicizes, which is drug overdose cases, um, death, uh, homelessness, we were highlighting the best of our city. We were highlighting the fact that there are beautiful people here that um, have great stories and want to do great things for our country. And we just need our country to service us back a little bit, just a tiny bit. And this is where the UBI comes into place. I believe that that's how we're going to pay back to our communities and help them um, lift them up and get them out of poverty. Um, and, you know, some people say, well, 1,200 is nothing. I'm like, well, it's better than nothing, obviously, right? Um, and my goal is we want communities to be independent. Um, and this is the best way to do it. When you hand cash to the community, we saw during the stimulus, the economy jumped back up. It was like a pulse, like, uh, like we saw live in the middle of COVID-19. Yeah. And I'm just so saddened that Congress doesn't realize the good they did with that $1,200 check and why we need to do that more often. They don't realize it. And I will tell you why that is. Most people will say, I don't know why Congress doesn't see it. They don't visit our communities. They don't come here. They don't and when I say here, it's places like here, which are thousands to millions in America, communities like mine, yeah. that the industrial era left us and just no, no politician ever came back um, yeah. with them. So, um, so those jobs left and so did the politicians. So that's why I'm running, because I'm hopefully going to translate those stories into policies. You know, I watch... Representative Manny Espitia, who's a good brother, um, he's just an amazing fighter at the state house today doing veto proof um, legislation. So basically, they were trying to repeat, uh, repeal the vetoes. And they were talking about minimum wage. The state of New Hampshire doesn't even have a minimum wage. So basically, we go by the federal government. So that means we value human beings at $7.25 an hour. That's what we think human labor is worth. That's what we think humans are worth here. And that's just ridiculous. Like, I don't think that any human being is worth seven twenty-five an hour. So, um, yeah. that's the kind of policies we want to fight for. Um, and of course, broadband, which it's terrible. Like, I do quite a few interviews lately, obviously because of the endorsements that have come through, and this happens very regularly. And you know, I don't feel bad so much for me or the host. I feel more. I feel bad for the people that depend on doing their jobs over the internet that they might be with a customer and might hang up on them because the internet cuts out or a kid might be listening to an instruction and completely completely misses something the teacher said because their internet cut out like i don't think it's fair i don't think that's the kind of society or country that i want to live in um yeah. and and honestly the more we talk to people they don't either um they just don't realize so my community it's it tends to be on the older scale so we're there's a lot of 65 plus citizens here in our city. And so some of them might not have kids in school. So this conversation about broadband, it might be a little bit irrelevant to them unless they're working or they rely on internet for some sort of uh, living. Um, but most of them don't. So they don't realize some of these struggles. So when I talk to them, it bridges our, our, our gaps here, our generations in our community. And they realize, wow, like I didn't think of that. I didn't think about how internet like right now, especially you know, people are doing their jobs from home. Doctors are talking to their patients. My mom is a cancer patient. And, you know, like we've had a million times where the doctor has had to call two, three, four times. It's very normal um, just because the internet has cut off. So mm -hmm. this is the reality we live in. And I want to present it. And I think I'm best positioned to present it to the state house, to our state, um, and really to our country. Lately, I've had a beautiful platform on social media where I've been able to highlight, you know, everything from what's happening here to what's happening in Puerto Rico. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Um, so I'm able to talk about what's happening there. Um, and I love everything that I get to do to lift people. It's exactly what I'm all about. Mm -hmm. Um, this, you talked about it a little bit, but uh, just about how, um, like right now, Congress, it, to me, it seems it seems obvious from anybody watching that they need to be doing 
way more and they haven't done anything now in pretty much four months. And you mentioned how it's like they just don't visit the communities enough. And I totally get it because I, I live 25 minutes from the White House and like around here, you drive around in the neighborhoods like most people, you wouldn't even realize that there's like an economic recession or depression going on. And that's kind of what I want to ask you about is just what are like some of those struggles that you see in your community every day that people in Washington aren't like hearing about or don't know is going on, but is the reason that we need to be doing so much more. And we really do need another stimulus. Oops, we lost Carlos. Sorry. Sorry. Did you hear my uh, question? I did hear most of it. You want to know the stories that are happening here on the ground that Washington yeah. DC doesn't get Just to like what, Yeah. Like what are the stories that are actually happening like to real people? Because not that the stories you see like on the news or whatever aren't real people, but I just feel like it to me it's I I've when I've been watching stuff lately, like like commercials and stuff and like for high tech gadgets, and you see like people like that look just like they're doing great financially and they have like these uh, smart devices and everything and the life's going great. And I'm just thinking like in my head is like, this is not how society is going right now. Like people are really struggling and really hurting. And I don't think like enough people know about it or really know what's going on, but you definitely would because you're in the community every day. Yes. So, I mean, there's several stories that pop up to my head. Um, this is one that I've been telling a lot lately because it had such an impact on me that I literally didn't sleep that night. Um, so I was about two weeks ago, prior to primary day, we were doing visibility by a corner here near my house um, at a busy intersection. And it was midday by the library. And this person that I've known for a very long time, like you can see them walking from a distance or in a hurry. And she had like a giant backpack and you could see, well, first of all, she was sunburned. And you could see the creases of the backpack on her. So it looked like she had been wearing that backpack for quite some time. And, you know, her clothes didn't look like had been washed. Like she looked like she was on a rough patch. And that's not the person I knew. So I immediately said, hey, how are you? And she goes, hey, I'm so glad you're running. And I said, thank you. How are you doing? Like, I haven't seen you in a long time, obviously, because of COVID-19. We don't interact very often here now. And she goes, well, I hit a rough patch in life and I'm just starting to get back up. And I said to her, oh, well, tell me about it. And she goes, well, I'm glad you're running because I know you care about these issues and you'll go fight for them. And I was like, well, I want to hear your specific situation because everybody's situation is different. She goes, well, you know, I was doing great. Um, my insurance got canceled because um, I was receiving unemployment money and my unemployment money was too much. So my insurance got canceled and I couldn't pay. I either had to pay rent, which it was $900 a month plus gas and everything else. Or I could pay, you know, $300 insurance and then like have less money in my, my hands. And so I slowly just started like losing control of my life because she had a, she, she has a drug addiction and, um, she just stopped seeing her therapist and because of COVID-19, like over the phone wasn't working, plus NA meetings weren't happening and just slowly her life just got out of control. And she goes, then I couldn't pay rent because I was using my money to use drugs. And one thing led to the other. And now I'm homeless and I'm carrying all my belongings in my back. And when I saw that, I was so devastated um, because she was somebody in the community that was very involved um and and so i i just i was I, I was just really like disturbed by it for the simple reason that i knew her as a very professional person and granted we all have our struggles in life that's not really what bothered me it was just that her life because we failed to each other as a society her life just completely collapsed um, and I have known people have died from drug, uh, from drug use. So drug overdoses. So I just know what that life leads to. And so I just felt nothing but moved and compassion and like sad that, that there was nothing I could personally do for her. And as a society, that's the kind of like world we live in. And, and furthermore, um, 
the fact that she needed to carry all her belongings in her back, like that is something that anybody who has been homeless is very familiar with. Um, you refuse to leave your belongings anywhere um, because you're afraid they're going to get stolen. And that's your life. That's your memories. That's your treasures, your, your life possessions, you know, and that's who we are. And so, you know, unfortunately that's, that's homelessness. And we just, don't do enough for people. And so when I saw that, you know, that's one of the stories that I like to tell. The other one is, um, so a guy running for Senate here, a good friend of mine, his name is Phil Spagnuolo. Um, he runs a men's sober house and he normally charges about 150 to $200 a week, depending on the room that somebody's renting for him. And it's a sober living house that he runs and he has two of them. And over COVID-19, he completely had to stop charging rent because otherwise it meant that these guys, this men's summer living home, these people would just end up in the streets. They had no money. Um, they came from poverty. He took them in, he got them jobs, and then they're paying rent so that he can pay the mortgage. And, you know, he gives them food. He, and I'm just like, I'm like, why? why? Why do we, in the richest nation on earth, do we need to struggle that much? We can have the most beautiful airplanes in the military. We can have the best weapons on earth, but yet we can't defend our own people here on the ground. We can't help them. We can't. And if we do, for some reason, our society has gotten to a point that it's like, it's looked at as a handout, as a, oh, we're just giving money away. And I just think it's so wrong. It's our, it's our money. You know, I've worked every single day of my life since I was 15 years old one or two jobs there is no reason why those taxes can't be used to help me help you help my neighbor um so to me that was something that you know this guy running for senate and he's also running for senate which is another low paying position in the state of new hampshire and he's running because one he was that guy that came from sober living um he has a phenomenal story about you know coming from drug addiction and you know the battle he's fighting for the rest of his life being a grandfather, being a father, being a husband. And so, you know, I hear them talk and I'm like, there's so much going on in our communities that Washington DC don't get, you know, domestic violence. As we speak every 15 minutes, there's a woman that has to, or a man that is choosing to stay in a domestic violence relationship because they don't have enough money to go and live on their own or, or choose for themselves a better future. And so they get stuck in that, in that lifestyle, in that, not lifestyle, sorry, that life cycle, um, which is a terrible one. And, you know, 15%, it's Hispanic Heritage Month, and we don't talk about this often enough. And I appreciate Bernie Sanders during Hispanic Heritage Month, he made a whole commercial with me, which I was like so proud because I has Hispanic to highlight my community is incredible. But I also highlighted the fact that 15 to 20% of all Latinos, Latinas in the, in the country are in the poverty rate, which means they're maybe going to maybe have one meal a day. That's it. Um, that's hunger. Like you can't live like that. And so um, I, I can't help but to think further that how kids are living, you know, and so when we think about, you know, when you ask the wealthiest, oh, we want to stop the welfare system. We want to stop, you know, these foster cares and all these things. This is how you stop it. This is how you stop that cycle. You make sure those people are not in poverty. You know, we stop the cycle from the beginning. And I think this is where UBI comes into place. You're going to eliminate all these bureaucracies that sometimes have so much wrong in them when you lift people out of poverty, when they don't have to depend on these systems anymore. So. Um, so that's why I'm passionate about these things. I've lived them. I've seen them. You know, my mom, unfortunately, experienced domestic violence um, many times with boyfriends that she had. And that's something that I got to see as a kid growing up. And it's something that I think about my whole entire life. And every single time I'm as a leader speaking in my community or anywhere, you know, this is something I bring up because this is something that we have control, that we have control of ending. And for some reason, society has just started to accept that instead of, oh, wait a second, we don't have to accept this. We don't have to live like this. Um, we can do something about it. We can change it. 
I've also yeah. lived in communities where I've seen uh, how we address these issues. You know, like I was fortunate enough to live in Haverhill, Massachusetts for a little bit as a kid. And I got to see like how effective shelters run and should be running, um, not treating people as let's put them all in a cage and feed them and then go to sleep and then wake up and do it again. Um, it was more like, here's an apartment. Here are your keys. Let's give you independence. Let's give you, here's your own food. You cook your own meals. If you don't know how to cook, we'll teach you. Um, you know, that's how we need to be treating issues. We need to be treating it from a humanity standpoint. And this is why I'm so moved by Andrew Yang, because from the beginning, he was talking about issues, not from, you know, a policy standpoint. He was talking about it from a life expect expectancy uh, view. He was talking about it from a happiness standpoint of view. You know, how beautiful would it be to measure our success on how happy we are? Like you imagine yeah. instead of finding out how wealthy your neighbor is, you will be like, hey, how happy are you? <laughs> like, how great is life for you? Um, it would be quite so the change. That's kind of like, you know, that's that's kind of what I want to do at a local level. And I think we can do it. Yeah. You mentioned how like to, you know, I, I think back to, oops, we lost Carlos again, but I'm sure he'll be right back. Uh, if you guys want to learn more about like, oops, he's back. We good? Yeah. Hey, so uh, I was going to say, you mentioned how like, and I was, well, I was going to say, uh, I'm not sure if you know who Scott Sands is. Uh, I'm sure you might have heard of him before if you haven't. Yeah, yeah but, I've uh, seen him on social media a couple of yeah. times. I think he we follow at, each other. Yeah, he spoke at the People's Party uh, convention a few weeks ago, and he was saying like how we accept now 200,000 people dead as normal. We accept poverty as normal. We accept homelessness as normal. And you mentioned how like we, uh, we can keep going. Like we accept so many things that are terrible as normal. And you mentioned how like we really just as a society really need to change our whole viewpoint on that. And I think again, just to like the people who just seem like really disconnected in Washington. And I saw like this tweet uh, or just like almost, I don't want to say like the elitist, or whatever, but I saw this tweet like from a uh, New York Times col columnist the other day, Nicholas Kristoff. He's like, I don't think we can exactly end poverty, but a realistic goal is to cut po child poverty in half. And I just read something like that, and I'm like, what do you mean we can't end poverty? It's so simple. You got to put buying power into people's hands, and like just this whole thing, like how it's it to him, it's like a good goal to be cut child poverty in half. What do you mean child poverty? Poverty in general should not be a thing how do we get more people to see that view that you embody so well of just seeing like 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 just we shouldn't accept the uh, uh, bernie sanders says so well in the richest like most wealthy country in the world like nobody should be like uh struggling so much you know i make this example um and i forget who was it that may quoted this um but the CARE Act gave more money to corporations than we have ever seen in the history of any bailout or stimulus in our country, right? There was a statistic out there that if we evenly split out the CARES Act, all the money that went out to corporations, we evenly split it out to people, we would have given them $59,000 per every American citizen. $59,000, not $1,200, $59,000. That's how you eradicate homelessness. That's how you eradicate poverty. And I think people have this, this illusion in their head about what poverty is. Poverty means several things. Not enough to eat, not a place to live. In many ways, edu lack of education can mean poverty too, intellectual poverty, I guess. Um, so with 59,000, I bet you, you and I can figure out how to live a better life. Um, and I know that somebody in poverty, they had $59,000 that was going to go to them for the course of the year, let's just say, which is kind of like the UBI example. I, I mean, and it's actually UBI is way less, the, the UBIs that we're proposing. I think Bernie Sanders, uh, Senator Harris, and Ed Markey's bill is $2,000, but... So $59,000, I mean, most Americans don't even get to see $59,000 a year, like, and, and they figure out how to get by. Like, so I figure 
$59,000, we can completely change and transform this country in a way that we've never even seen. And actually, I think the rich will benefit most out of that because the companies that they own, people are going there. They're going to be going there to buy, you know, they're going to be investing. You know, I was talking on a show the other day and, and um, with Ariel, who is a, a big Yang Yang um, guy. And he was telling me how with his stimulus money, he always wanted to buy this drone to take professional photography. And he went and bought it. And I'm like, you know, all the companies we were benefiting because we would all be buying something that we really have always wanted to buy. We would stock our fridges so the farm industry yeah. would benefit from it. Um, clothing, you know, that's something that in, in, in poverty stricken homes, um, you know, people might have one sweater, maybe one jacket, you know, maybe shoes that they've had for 15 years. Well, guess what? Now they're going to go buy new sneakers and maybe they'll go and buy really nice sneakers, you know, and um, they'll buy a nice jacket that is not like cheap material that is actually maybe made in, in America because they decided I'm going to go and buy in downtown because now I can. Yeah. You know, $59,000 does not make you rich. But I do know that uh, the way we Americans are, we give back. Um, so, and I work in marketing. So from my understanding, you know, the trajectory of America and, and shopping and the way we spend money, I know they would go back to the community. So at the end of the day, we would have done a service to our economy, to our country and to American made companies. But, you know, these politicians are so out of touch. They're vacationing, not where you or I will vacation, which is nearby in our communities. They're going out away from here, luxurious places where they're out of touch from reality. You know, it, it serves, the Buddha story is one that I love and I hate to bring religion, but I think this is how politicians are living. You know, the Buddha lived in a castle and his parents kept him away from poverty and suffering and he never got to see anything ugly. And so when he got out of the castle, when he got out of the castle, sorry about that. When he got out of the castle, he was shocked. He, he, he saw so much, poverty, so much sickness, so much suffering that he wanted to run away from his castle and he wanted to like do something about it. So I think when these politicians are forced to leave their castle, to leave their luxurious lives and face our community, you know, they're humans like you and I, they're going to like smell the roses. They're going to be like, you know what, my community is suffering. And if they don't realize that, you know what, maybe the community will see it and say, this person has no right to be representing me. And they'll maybe uprise and say, you know what, we're gonna vote you out. And that's what my goal is, hopefully to enlighten people to like realize that, you know, there are people suffering in my community and your community. And we need to make sure that our politicians see that, like they need to stop vacationing elsewhere. They need to vacation. They're our service, they're to our service. So they should be vacationing in our communities and watching what's happening in our communities and how, you know, the conditions that, um, I bet you that if any of our congressmen went on vacation in our communities and realized how poor the broadband networks are in our communities, they, they would just, they would go straight to Congress to do something about it. Cause I'm sure nobody wants to go on vacation and have poor service. Like, you know, uh, we live around here with two bar service and we're lucky if we get 3G. So um, it, it's just not not right. So it affects people's lives. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one thing uh, I think that you would have a really good answer to this question, and uh, I think it applies definitely because you mentioned earlier how you know Laconia, your area, it's actually a district that Trump won by fourteen points. And when you you ran for the seat back in twenty eighteen, I believe, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But and you actually you lost, but just narrowly by 244 votes. And I kind of think like this, I guess this is what I want to ask. Andrew Yang's slogan was not left, not right forward. What does that mean to you, especially in a district where it is more swingy and Trump did carry it in 2016? Yeah, well, I mean, the good news is Donald Trump is not leading this district by much this time around compared to 2016. He's only four points ahead of Joe Biden. So to me, I think we're going to close the gap between now and November 3rd. And I do think that I have a better message than my opponents, um, which is all that should matter, you know, what kind of service I want to be to my community. What Andrew Yan, when he says not left, not right, forward, 
is that we're not going to look at each other from a rear view mirror or from a distance or from a specific angle or a specific lens in life. We're going to look at each other as you're a human, Matt. I'm a human, Carlos. And we got to start servicing each other. We have to like help each other. We have to give each other a hand. You know, somebody asked me the other day um, if I would ever have a conversation with a Donald Trump supporter and would I ever uh, try to get their vote? And the answer is absolutely. Both of my neighbors happen to be uh, Republican conservative. One is a Baptist pastor and the other one is a retired uh, engineer that has always voted Republican. So his mindset has been pretty much all set since you know, since he started voting and both I have their votes. And one of the things that I talk about to them is I don't talk about ideology. I don't talk about um, color politics. I talk about issues. I talk about like, okay, well, how can your life be better? And, you know, for him, for, for the retired engineer and his spouse, um, you know, they like to go to Florida and obviously COVID-19 is going to get in their way of that. Property taxes have been going up lately, so they feel like they have to tighten up their purse. Um, otherwise, they might lose the opportunity to continue to live in their home. Um, and then the other neighbor has two kids. They're a pastor. And so we talk about public education. We talk about how we can make that better. Um, right now, kids have to pay for their meals. I don't think that should be happening. I think we should make a meal part of our education um so it should be free to students and for the retired engineer i talk new hampshire is one of the very few states that doesn't have an income and in sales tax and people say well why would you even propose one because right now we're exploiting property taxes the only way the state is collecting revenue and right now we have millions of people that visit the state of new hampshire on vacation are using our infrastructure are exploiting our resources and are not paying us back so we need to find ways to raise that revenue without really putting it on the property owner's backs, which at some point in the state of New Hampshire, so every year taxes go up because of it, because that's all we rely on. Um, so at some point, the middle class, we're gonna wipe it out of the state of New Hampshire. And we're also gonna wipe out the elderly because they're on a fixed income. They're not going to be able to go to work, pick up a job and pay whatever they need to make up the the, the remainder of their taxes. Yeah. So we talk about those things um and, and there's another solution which andrew yang speaks about very often which is the way to pay for a ubi i talk about um i talk about how we need to start taxing these big corporations that rely on technology that are stealing jobs from our community so if these companies are going to rely on robots that's great awesome you're going to save a lot of money as a company but guess what you're going to have to pay for the labor costs that, that we're losing in our community, that the money that our community is losing because you're no longer employing in our community. So um, it has to be a two way road. It has to stop being this, oh, um, you know, businesses first. And you know, it has to be a two way road. Our community has to benefit from whatever these companies are also benefiting from. Yeah. So that's kind of the issues I talk about when I'm relating to my neighbors. And they honestly, they don't understand all this fanfare the social media makes for me. Like they, they, they don't get, they're like, you know, when I get called a progressive, a lefty, or maybe some Republicans come and attack me, they just don't get it. Cause they're like, you're a nice guy who is just trying to do the right thing and we're behind you. And that's all that they know. Like they, they don't, they don't see this yeah. color politics stuff. And I try not yeah. to play to it cause it's divisive. It is. And we really just need to get rid like away from labels in general. They're not helpful because they mean different things to different people. And yep. I also think like just in general, uh, like everyone tries to make just things black and white. You're this or that. It's always usually a gray area. It's always somewhere in between. I want to ask you uh, like one more question before uh, we end this. And I think it's uh, a question that doesn't get asked enough. It's um, everyone's just always focused on what's going on on the national level. Like what's the president doing? What's Congress up to? But honestly, like most of the actual uh, like things that matter in our day to day lives that people have a say over, it's happening at the local level. It's happening through city councils or the mayor or state government. And you're obviously they're embedded at the local level. Like what advice would you have for people who do want to get more involved at the local level and fight for things that would mean that not only like I think would impact the community more, but it, it's actually easier, I'd say, to influence your city council or your local government than trying to convince Congress to do anything. So 
Um, well, my advice to people is find local committees. Um, like, you know, if you're a Democrat, find a Democrat committee or local organizations that are looking for people to get involved and start getting involved there. I got involved with AmeriCorps and that's kind of how my passion for community started. Um, it doesn't need to be politics. You could be making a difference through Sierra Club, um, you know, like LGBTQ organizations. Maybe you're passionate about women's rights. So maybe you can get involved with your local uh, Planned Parenthood organization. So there's all kinds of groups that you can get involved. That's the first step that I would take. And then after that, find what you're passionate about, what policies, and if you want to run for office, do it. Don't don't wait for, for people to tell you to give you the green light. If that was the case, I wouldn't be running today. I would I would literally just be waiting for somebody to give me the green light. Still to this day, there are people that don't think I'm old enough to be running. So to me, um, just you know, just do it. Whatever you're passionate about, just go for it. You know, my partner um, owns a business, and when he first started thinking about running a business. He um, he was like asking people what they thought and some people were like, I don't know, it's risky and all that. And he's like, then one day somebody said to him, just do it, worst case scenario, it doesn't work out and you go back to your old job. And so my advice to people is just um, just do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And you learn as you go, you know, whatever you don't know, you're going to find out as you go, so. Mm -hmm. Well, Carlos, thank you very much for coming on the show. What is your website again? I know I have it linked down in the description. No problem. Uh, it's www. So three W. Sorry, uh, Carlos Cardona. The number four. The letter N. The letter H. dot com. So Carlos Cardona. The number four. N H. dot com. And of course, you can find me on Twitter at N H Cardona six zero three. If you have questions? Ask me. I'm an open book, and I'm looking to uh, get as many people involved as possible because that's what's going to take to win this election. Awesome. Well, I think that you pers like you very uh, I think you're a great representation of what a representative should look like, what a representative should sound like. It's so obvious that you really, really care about everybody watching. And I wish you the best of luck in the general election. I hope everybody who's watching check out Carlos's website. Consider leaving a donation. I know uh, um, Tareen Patrick is watching this and he actually lives in New Hampshire. So maybe he'd be able to help out. Uh, volunteer or something in person if you're watching patrick which i know you are but either way uh thank you everybody for watching thank you again thank to you carlos and uh hope everybody has a great rest of the evening take care